We'll now take uh, public comment from those who wish to address the Council on items that appear on today's agenda. Public comment will be limited to 20 minutes. We will end public comment at 2.30. When your name is called, please come to either one of the microphones at the front of the chamber. Each speaker will receive two minutes. Please give your name and identify the agenda item that you wish to address. Once your two minutes has expired, the microphone will be turned off. First uh, speaker is Terry Finn, followed by Imogene Williams and Jack Smith. Thank you, President Burgess, members of the Council. I'm Terry Finn, I'm newly retired uh, Executive Director of Government Affairs for BNSF Railway, but I was pressed into service today by my successor, who had to be in another part of the state for another engagement. Um, as we've already testified in front of the Council's Planning, Land Use, and Sustainability Committee, BNSF has strong reservations about the oil train resolution before you today that has already been passed by the committee. Yes, we all want to move goods as safely as, possibly, as we possibly can. However, local calls for regulation, local rules, special requests, become a real problem for a railroad that operates in 28 states and two Canadian provinces. The request in Section 1 for detailed reporting of commodity types, routes, volumes, is the kind of information that shippers normally <coughs> hold very close to the vests and is considered proprietary. What's more, the Transportation Security Administration discourages and sometimes bans outright the disclosure of that kind of inf uh, information by com commodity type. BNS F does agree with Section 2, which urges upgraded design regulations for tank cars uh, and rail cars and other equipment. The company took a strong leadership uh, position two or three weeks ago by announcing that it would purchase 5,000 state-of-the-art tank cars for hauling uh, sensitive commodities, oil, and other commodities. And uh, this is unusual for a railroad. They normally don't own their tank cars. Uh, more investigation, more in study for the uh, company does not feel as necessary. We feel that there's so much delay already built into the system that it, it becomes an economic factor on its own right. Uh, suspending train shipments during sporting events is also not something we're fond of, and it can, there's considerable irony in that given the amount of voices in the industrial area who have urged people not to place crowd uh, attracting venues in, the, in Soto. Thank so you. with that, I'll end my testimony. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Finn. Ms. Williams? I remembered something. It came back to me that two years ago, a couple of years ago, Mike McGinn was a mayor and I stood in this exact spot and said, the monster digger will break down, it's too big, it's too complicated, it will not work. So I hope you will consider my, word, my thoughts about the trains coal and oil trains. I understand they are already rolling through our state and our city. How, how can this be? 100 cars in each train. There will be accidents. How many people... Uh, there was an accident about a year ago in Lac Megantic in Quebec. How many people died? 47 people died. There are going to be accidents. We really have... To, you know, the energy companies have brainwashing. You've, you've seen it if you watch TV. It's every day. Uh, the, the smooth lady, I think she's compu a computer. She's a computer lady. And something about connecting the dots. And it, it's nothing but brainwashing. We're not supposed to talk about climate change and we're not supposed to think about climate change. Of course there are going to be accidents. And we actually have to rethink this whole thing. I hope our leadership is going to begin to think that we have to leave the coal and the oil in the ground. So we have a livable planet for our children and our grandchildren. Already, 
New Zealand has accepted thousands of people from the islands because their lands are underwater. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Jack Smith. Thank Mr. Smith. Thank you for a chance to testify on this very important issue. Um, we've got to end this nation's dependency on fossil fuels. They are, vet I can't even say the word, they're left over from the dinosaurs. That's where they come from. And they're as obsolete as the dinosaurs. They're kept alive by the excess profits that we're allowing the fossil fuel companies. We must end this dependency, stop the restraints on innovation, which they cause with their money, and replace them with renewable and sustainable energy. As long as profits keep the system going, there won't be innovation. What happened to the California electric car? A starting place for protecting our citizens from the potential of exploding oil, cars, trains, whatever it is, is here today. Thank you. And I reserve the last 52 minutes for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Scott Shook or Scott Shock? Sorry, I can't read your last name here. Shock. Shock. President Burgess, council members, my name is Scott Shock. And I believe that privacy is a fundamental human right. I have a list of important questions for you regarding the Department of Homeland Security funding bill. Number one, regarding unsustainability of funding. Aren't police department functions one of the most basic services of a local government? Why is the city funding basic public services with unsustainable federal funding with strings attached? Number two, regarding public hearings. Have you held any public hearings at a time or place that the public can attend, like in the evening? Why did you bypass the expected committee hearing on February 24th? Is there something to hide? Number three, regarding illegality and liability. Do you fully understand the impact of the DHS-funded programs on fundamental civil rights, such as the rights to privacy and due process? Are you aware of the checkered history of the fusion centers funded by DHS? Have you considered the extent to which the facial recognition system could be misused or abused? For example, disproportionate impacts on minorities through bias in programming, data collection, or usage. Have you considered how voting for this bill would violate your oath to uphold the Washington State and U.S. Constitutions in the eyes of voters? Number four, regarding effective policing and transparency. Do you believe that funding surveillance programs supports the desired model of community policing and trust building? Or will these programs sow further seeds of mistrust? Do you believe that local police departments should be militarized and beholden to federal interests or only serve the interests of local citizens? Given the plethora of critical questions about this bill, I urge you to vote no on this bill. Will you vote no and protect the citizens of Seattle or will you be hooked by the lure of easy money? Thank you. Lee, Lee Colleton and Karen Tarr. Hello, Council. My name is Lee Colleton, and I believe that privacy is a fundamental human right. More so, it is essential to humanity. To be human, you must have privacy. And <clears throat> I'm concerned that uh, item one on your agenda here, the accepting of money from the Department of Homeland Security for the uh, UASI, or Urban Area Security Initiative, will compromise the privacy of the citizens of Seattle. Um, I don't think that this has been carefully thought through. I know that for the past decade, the city has been accepting money from the federal government, and it is important to realize that this money does come with strings attached, even if the cameras that it's putting in and the mesh network aren't overtly connected to fusion centers or uh, f federal agencies the presence of this equipment compromises our privacy because, as we have learned, the NSA and the FBI will gain access to any hardware that you install, whether you want them to or not. Please vote no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Tarr. 
Karen will be followed by Rachel Cox. Thank you for allowing me to speak before the council and on the issue of the oil train resolution. I urge the Seattle Council support on this resolution today on your vote. Um, I'm coming from several different angles at this issue. And the first one I'm going to talk about is that it is my, a very personal one in that my daughter attends the Seattle Art Institute which is located along the tracks in downtown Seattle. She also lives in downtown Seattle. And on behalf of her, the student body at the school and all of the businesses and the um, residents in the city of Seattle and the state of Washington along the route, all the way to North Dakota, human beings that are at risk right now with a known risk, not a perceived risk, I urge a vote on this resolution today. And I think that there needs to be a very well thought out, um, well, well thought out um, planning for this to, for these, or for the oil to be transported again um, with the 5,000 new trains as the gentleman has from, that's talking on behalf of BNSF today. Those 5,000 train cars are essential. The new train cars are essential to make sure that there is safety. I also come to you from the angle of being an environmental scientist who formerly has worked on oil spill cleanup, hands-on, working on oil spill cleanup at, train, at a train yard. And I can tell you it is very, very difficult and very expensive to clean up oil contamination. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Cox. Rachel will be followed by Christopher Sheets. President Burgess and council members, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Rachel Cox from Stoll Reeves, and I'm representing Western States Petroleum Association. WISPA is pleased to provide the following comments on the, C on the City Council's proposed resolution 31504. WISPA is a nonprofit trade organization representing 26 companies that explore for, produce, refine, and market petroleum, petroleum products, natural gas, and other energy products in Washington and four other Western states. WISPA members own and operate Washington's five petroleum refineries. As you consider the resolution on rail transport of petroleum, we want you to know that WISPA and its members share the concerns of city leaders and citizens in Seattle and other Washington communities regarding the safe transportation of crude oil by rail. We understand it is absolutely critical to transport both crude oil and refined products in the safest, most responsible manner, and believe it is important for communities, the petroleum industry, and railroads to work together to ensure our rail transportation system is safe as possible. Petroleum products drive the economy. Washington is the eighth in the nation as a consumer of jet fuel at 813 million gallons a year. Drivers and other users in the state consume 2.6 billion gallons of gasoline and 107 million gallons of diesel each year. Altogether, the state consumes 4.7 billion gallons of petroleum products annually. While there continues to be local and national efforts, to reduce the reliance on fossil fuels. Even the most optimistic experts will tell you that the region's economy and employment base will be directly tied to petroleum supplies until the, at least the year 2040. Thank you. Thank you, and if you'd like to leave a copy of your statement, you can with us. Should I leave it here? Yeah, thank you. Christopher Sheets. Christopher will be followed by George Keefe. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Christopher Sheets, here to address Council Bill 118043. Uh, I believe privacy must be maintained as a fundamental human right. I speak to you today as a Seattle resident of three years where I work as a Microsoft Systems Engineer. Uh, Nineteen years ago, I was a resident of Oregon where I was born. My two brothers, my mother, and I were victims of domestic violence to the degree that threats were made against our lives. 
Having consulted the police, their recommendation to my mother was to purchase a gun, which was an unacceptable course of action to my family. The four of us packed everything that we could into our car, leaving behind our house and friends destined to start a new life in Washington State. We immediately became members of the Washington State Address Confidentiality Program, commonly referred to as the Witness Protection Program. The Address Confidentiality Program covers a broad spectrum of abuse, including all types of abuse of power. I speak on behalf of the thousands of victims like me and my family, whose physical location privacy is paramount to living out a peaceful and productive life. Often victims of physical or mental abuse must hide from law enforcement itself. As a member of InfraGuard, the private-public partnership between security-focused private industry, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the United States Secret Service, I can attest that DHS-funded fusion centers routinely share surveillance data between stakeholders that are unknown to the public in the name of national security. Do not fund surveillance systems because once you create privacy violating surveillance data, the unintended consequences of the use of that data are uncontrollable, no matter the city level policies designed to control it. Please vote no on Council Bill 118043. Thank you. Thank you. George Keith. George will be followed by David Robinson. My name is George Keefe, and I come to speak to you in support of Resolution 31504. Consistent with national security, I think it is imperative that our public officials have access to full information to assess the risk of oil by train from a safety perspective, from an environmental perspective, and economic perspective. There are now more than three trains daily, 100 cars long, uh, traveling to the refineries in Ferndale and Blaine and Anacortes. Some of these cars now are highly explosive. There was an article in the March 3rd uh, Wall Street Journal that trains are much more flexible in pipelines, that the use of oil by trains is going to increase. I think this is a current issue and will become only greater in the future. Thank you. Thank you. David Robinson. Good afternoon. I am uh, David Robinson. I'm a co-founder of the Seattle Privacy Coalition, and I believe that privacy is a fundamental human right. Um, the Seattle Privacy Coalition appreciates the contacts that we've had with uh, several council members, uh, Lakata, O'Brien, Harold, Clark, uh, and uh, we hope to continue uh, working with you to find a way to avoid us having to come at the last minute like this and uh, uh, bring up issues that, uh, that uh, highly technical uh, surveillance technologies uh, uh, bring up in the civil rights area. Um, since the Edward Snowden disclosures, we know that federal intelligence and law enforcement agencies stockpile vast amounts of data about law-abiding <coughs> citizens, and we know that constitutional rights are no barrier to this project. Why do they gather this information? Because today's law-abiding citizens may be tomorrow's criminals. Unfortunately, a society where all citizens are suspects is the precise definition of a police state. The federal dollars at issue today are meant to purchase Seattle's support for this state, and they come uh, for, for this uh, pro yeah support for the state, and they come with obligations. Data gathered in Seattle will be shared with any state authority or private entity that wants it badly enough. Agreements that limit and disclose data sharing are meaningless when trumped by a warrant or a gag order, or when the data is simply stolen. If you collect it, you will share it. You will contribute to anti-terror programs that always become anti-dissent and anti-labor programs in practice. You will add names and faces of Seattle residents to databases that our paranoid government will troll for internal enemies and other suspects. I ask you to choose a different path for Seattle. And I have a brochure. <laughs> I would like the uh, clerk, please, to enter this into the record. And uh, if any council members would like a copy of the brochure. Uh, I have several here. Um, I can leave Why don't you give those to the clerk, too, okay. and then we'll pass them out. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Our last speaker will be Thank Philip Mook. Why last? I'm last. I'll exhibit. Hi, my name is Philip Mosek, and I believe that privacy is a fundamental human right. Uh, I'm, I have some comments about the first item on your agenda, uh, acceptance of yet another year of funding from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to contribute to what is effectively a black budget uh, for the Seattle Police Department. If they really needed the things that they might purchase with this money, they should put it on the regular budget and let you know about it. I want to address one thing in particular that they have proposed using the money for. They intend to purchase facial recognition software. And the one program that they have suggested that they will use it for is the so-called booking photo comparison system. 
uh, they might just as easily use the same software to compare someone's photograph to a database of driver's license photos or of Facebook photos or of people who were photographed and later identified at a political protest. Uh, the policy that they have provided that they uh, intend to restrict themselves uh, using this booking photo system is pretty weak um, for various reasons. And I encourage you legislators and lawyers to look through it with an eye for loopholes. It drifts between policy directives and intended use of the system and expectations of how the system will be used. It does not say this shall be, it says this should be or this may be. Uh, even the portions of that policy that sound restrictive are very crafty. For instance, it says that they will use the system only to search for the identities of photos of people who are reasonably suspected of a crime. Well. Uh, they're talking about Terry stops. If you have uh, someone who, is, has, when, when a police officer has reasonable suspicion, but not probable cause, he can stop someone and question them for a brief period of time. That person in Washington state is not obligated to identify himself. In the Heibel decision in 2004, the Supreme Court that said that states may pass, pass laws requiring people to identify themselves in Terry stops, but Washington state is not one of the 25 or so states that are called stop and identify states. We're about to give the police the uh, opportunity to identify people who have the right to remain anonymous. And I urge you not to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Our public comment period is, has ended. We're, we're not going to do that today because of our agenda. And we have another. Mr. Zimmerman, please sit down. No, I don't want to sit down because it's for even invite you to extend people. Mr. Zimmerman, you're disrupting our meeting, and if you continue, you'll have to leave. It's exactly what is possible. No, I don't need to sit down. It's absolutely my definition. It's idiotic situation. Mr. Zimmerman, we made it clear, as we do at every meeting, that we'll have 20 minutes of public comment. We've actually gone over a couple of minutes. What is my number? Not my number, 10. It doesn't matter what your number is. Public comment period is over. And if you, won't, if, if you don't sit down, you'll be asked... If you don't sit down, so what? You're, <laughs> the so what is that you're disrupting our meeting and you'll be expelled. Well, I'm yeah. You disrupt your meeting. Yeah. Mr. Zimmerman, your last chance to sit I down know what or else. Uh, you is Mr. I Zimmerman, I'm sorry, you have to leave. Please uh, make sure that Mr. Zimmerman leaves the uh, chambers. We'll now take up uh, payment of bills. Um, please read the bill into the record. Council Bill 118049, appropriating money to pay certain audited claims and ordering the payment thereof. It's moved and seconded that the bill pass. Are there any comments? Please call the roll on the passage of the bill. Clark? Aye. Godden? Aye. Harrell? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Rasmussen? Aye. Sawant? Aye. Backshaw? Aye. And President Burgess? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed? The bill passes and the chair will sign it. Committee reports. Please read the report of the full council. Report of the full council, agenda item one, council bill 118043, relating to security from terrorism, authorizing the city to partner with the state of Washington and King County to receive financial assistance from the Department of Homeland Security, Office for State and Local Government, Coordination and Preparedness under the Urban Areas Security Initiative, grant for federal fiscal year 2012, authorizing an application for allocation of funds under that agreement, amending the 2014 adopted budget ordinance 124349 by increasing appropriations to the Seattle Police Department and Seattle Fire Department in accepting revenues and ratifying and confirming prior acts, all by three-fourths vote of the City Council, introduced February 24, 2014. Council Member Harrell. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank all the folks that have come out to testify on behalf of the legislation, even if it's opposing the legislation as part of the process. Uh, this legislation, Bill 118043, basically authorizes the city to receive revenue from the Department of Homeland Security from the Urban Area Security Initiative, otherwise known as UASI. It actually funds nine projects. Many of the, uh, the projects are somewhat, I guess would say, innocuous. Um, a position for helping vulnerable pop populations as it relates to warning uh, uh, systems and emergency systems, uh, uh, citizens preparedness and outreach positions, um, enforcement training and drills, um, uh, rescue suits, uh, projects of that nature. And I'm going to describe the process by which we reached the decision we did because 
the booking uh, photo comparison software is something that our office flagged when first looking at the receipt of these funds. And we flagged it going all the way back to November because we recognize when surveillance equipment is used and technology is used, heightened sensitivity and scrutiny by ourselves as elected leaders should be used. And that's exactly what happened during this process. Back in uh, November of last year, the police department indicated that they were uh, seeking use of these funds and would use this kind of software, which I think many of you know, basically automates a manual system whereby a suspect, and I'll define a suspect later, a suspect's image can be then used into a software system and certain hits, if you will, will be identified. It's been used in many other jurisdictions and Seattle wanted to be a user of this technology in this software. So what occurred back in November is we asked the police department to work with the privacy groups, the ACLU and others, to make sure that there was a, uh, a meaningful community engagement process in discussing the pros and cons of this legislation. Will it be used for Terry stops as an example? It will not be used for Terry stops. So we asked them to come to the committee and have an open and transparent conversation about this, and that's what we did. We started in January to having discussions, and we scheduled our first meeting in February. On February 5th, we had at the table uh, Assistant Chief Carmen Bess, uh, Lieutenant Mark Mount, uh, uh, members, for, um, other members from the police department, such as Captain Ron Levell. We had Mr. Doug Clunder from the ACLU, their privacy council. And we had a robust discussion that day, and we listened to many of you voice your concerns there. We did not vote it out of committee because we wanted to work on it a little more. We then had another uh, meeting, uh, public hearing on February 19th. We had many of the same folks. We also had members from the Human Rights Commission to look at it from a human rights standpoint. Again, we, we prepared a Q&A on how this technology would be used. Would it be used for Terry stops? Would it be only used for um, suspects, as an example? And there was language in the policies actually negotiated listening to, the, to these concerns. And as, and as a result of that, I'll quote uh, Mr. Mr. Doug Kleiner from the ACLU who said, quote, please feel free to let the committee members know, the council members, that the ACLU is pleased that the Seattle Police Department narrowed its policy on the booking photo comparison software to apply to suspects only, and that we have no objections to the policy as written. Uh, so what we then did is, as, I continue, as we continue to work with the different privacy advocates, and again, we appreciate the interface, we, made, we tried to make sure that the um, the community's voice was heard in that process as well. Um, again, we have put online a sort of a Q&A on how the software would be used. Again, we are automating a manual system that is in use now. Uh, we, we are asking the police department to continue to ask us what tools uh, are, they think they need to do their job better. And the Council put in place, as you may recall, last year, some very stringent safeguards whenever the police department will use surveillance equipment. They, even while, during, while the purchasing decision is made, they must come to the council first. They must describe how the technology will be used, who will have access to it. And I'll close my comments by saying that uh, one of the questions that was raised is how do we prevent mission creep, uh, usage creep over the course of time? Well, we also put in the policy a very uh, specific uh, software usage log that will be audited annu annually by the Seattle Police Department's Audit Policy and Research Group. The log will contain the following information, the date of inquiry, the name of the operator or, or uh, entity making the inquiry, the name of the officer requesting uh, the inquiry, a description of the inf incident that satisfy all criteria, and the GO number, which is the general offense number if applicable. So in other words, we will keep a record as to who and why who uses, this, who, who uses the database and software and why? So again, I think we've done a, 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 a good job at the public outreach, listening to your concerns, putting the safeguards in place from a policy standpoint, and making sure that it can be protected and your rights can be, can be protected. The committee uh, recommends passage of this bill. So Councilmember Harrell has moved passage of Bill 118043. Is there a second? Second. Great. Councilmember Bagshaw. Thank you. Um, I want to thank people who have come to talk to us about this. And a number of you who are in the audience today 
know that I worked with you um, extensively as chair of the parks department to make sure that we didn't have live cameras in our parks or cameras where people could then go back even after the fact and look to see who was walking through our parks. And I'm going to be supporting Councilmember Harrell's recommendation today in no small part because of the public process that we had that included um, the ACLU. I found that to be particularly important uh, because I really felt that what the police needed to commit to us is that they would not use the cameras for IDing purposes. It could not be used to ID a citizen who is not either actively involved in a criminal process or that the officer did not reasonably suspect was involved in criminal activity. This is an opportunity for us to make our city safer, I believe, without compromising our privacy issues. And frankly, we talked about earlier today that we um, promote women's rights. And one of the things that we have learned in this city is that when women feel safe, everybody feels safe. And if women do not feel safe, we aren't safe. And I believe that this is one step in the right direction. So I'm going to be supporting this legislation. Council Member Sawant. Thank you, President Burgess. I recognize that several of the nine projects that would receive funding through this Department of Homeland Security grant are legitimate, like trainings for emergency response and citizen preparedness. I'm also aware that the ACLU has been involved in this process and their specific concern was addressed. I am nevertheless concerned about providing additional support to the Seattle Police Department in terms of expanding facial recognition capabilities to the booking photo comparison software. The Department of Justice report filed in 2012 raised serious concerns that some SPD policies and practices, particularly those related to pedestrian encounters, result in very discriminatory policing. I am concerned that the facial recognition technology that this grant would provide could be used in the same pattern of discriminatory policing. The DOJ also found that when SPD officers use force, they do so in an unconstitutional manner nearly 20% of the time. During all this time that unconstitutional force was being used, the Office of Police Accountability very rarely found wrongdoing. I am hesitant to further empower police officers with technology that could be misused when investigation of allegations appear to be ineffective. In addition to my concerns specific to the SPD and the booking software, I have larger concerns about how this grant would provide funding to the Washington State Fusion Center, which has a history of spying on activists and is currently involved in a lawsuit related to the infiltration of the Port Militarization Resistance anti-war movement. A two-year Senate investigation in 2012 found that fusion centers often produced irrelevant, useless, or inappropriate intelligence reporting to DHS, and many produced no intelligence reporting whatsoever. The report also said that in many cases, the fusion centers violated civil liberties or privacy. I am furthermore most concerned and alarmed because this, in, this, has to be, this has to take into account the partnership between the NSA and the DHS. Despite ample evidence, there was initial denial that the NSA had been illegally spying on U.S. citizens, and we know, that, we know now, thanks to pe courageous people like Edward Snowden, that that's actually happening, and in fact, I have here this article from January from the New York Times, which reported extensively on that. And uh, no amount of verbal assurance can guarantee that the fundamental right to privacy will be protected, and it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to undo the damage. I am also concerned about providing funding to the Washington State Fusion Center because of its partnership with Law Enforcement Intelligence Unit, which is a private, secretive intelligence organization that has targeted anti-war, black, tribal, community, and labor organizers for the past 50 years. For all the above reasons, I am voting no on this bill. Council Member. Yeah. Councilmember Clark. Councilmember Clark. Councilmember Harrell. Yeah, he was for, he was for him. Yeah. Councilmember Clark will follow up. Uh, thanks for those comments from my colleague, uh, Councilmember Sawant. See, first of all, with respect to the race issues addressed by the DOJ, I think your concerns are somewhat misplaced in that this software is exactly the kind of software 
that we, we would need. The software algorithm will not do comparisons based on sex, hair, color of skin, race. That what we have now is a manual system where officers actually make subjective decisions based on this, and this software is designed to take that out of the equation, number one. Uh, number two, um, again, it is not used uh, for victims or uh, witnesses. That was very clear that the, the concern of the ACLU was whether it was just uh, used for suspects, suspects that there's some reasonable belief that they have just committed a crime. The typical case we talk about is a person that just uh, was, you know, just robbed a bank and there's footage of this person to be used again um, against the actual database. They do it now and this is a manual system and so this actually just accelerates the, the process as many jurisdictions do. Uh, I won't get into the pros and cons of the Fusion Center because I suppose everyone has an opinion on that. I would, I would just use some facts that the fact is the Fusion Center, as you may recall, all of you may recall, uh, was very successful in arresting two radicals, Muslim radicals, um, Abdul Khalid Abdul Latif and Wali Mujandi. And those are serious cases. Those are serious ter terrorists that this center did, uh, through their work, did uh, apprehend. And they were indeed terrorists. So I, I won't, I, I know everyone has a, uh, uh, an idea on or an opinion on the use of the Fusion Center. I won't express my personal opinion, but this is um, law enforcement working together, making sure we have safeguards in place such that we know who is using the data. And I think this legislation goes toward that end. Councilmember Clark. So um, I do want to thank Councilmember Harrell and his staff for uh, working this. And Councilmember Harrell went through the number of meetings. And many of you have, have participated in either the meetings or the conversations offline. And uh, certainly there's some uh, strong feelings about uh, several elements of, of what's here. I mean, a couple of, couple of people testified to say, you know, why, why accept the money at all? Uh, we accept grant money because we don't have enough money to do everything that we need to do in the contemporary world throughout the city, let alone uh, the basics that we are stretching to try to meet with general fund on a regular basis. Uh, that does not mean that we go after every grant. Uh, and certainly uh, there should be strong review of a grant like this when, uh, when it is in public safety. And I think someone used the term of you know, the black budget. And uh, there should be as much transparency about this as possible. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. So. Uh, we, I like to think that we go after grants and council is a part of some of those forward conversations about which grants the city will pursue and whether they are worth it, whether the strings that come attached to those uh, get in the way of achieving public good or not. So the concerns about what we do with this money, uh, it is completely good that we have walked through everything here and that Councilmember Harrell's committee and staff have taken the time to review what is a part of the grant application and I think the police department over the past few years has become a little bit more used to people wanting to know specifically up front uh, what is being purchased and what is the public value and the public benefit of those purchases. The opportunity uh, to do better training, to do better hazard response, to do better infrastructure structural collapse response, to do better citizen preparedness, particularly with vulnerable populations, I would love to say that we could do all of that out of the general fund. That is unlikely to happen unless we have an amazing uptick in the general fund that none of us are, are seeing in the numbers going forward. The, uh, the facial rec recognition software that did pique everybody's interest, and, and there have been a number of conversations about what that one does. Um, the opportunity, I guess for me, the bottom line is that the opportunity to connect with uh, the King County folks, possibly in the future, the Pearson, Snohomish County, and Washington State, databases, uh, again, booking photos and looking at how to constrain that use in the right way, I think that that is valuable in terms of trying to um, appropriately and without um, some, of, some of the errors uh, locate suspects using advancements in technology. How that technology gets deployed and used, how the data is used, how, um, how we roll out some of these advances, if you want to call them advances, some people probably in this room would not. That's what's important, and I think we've had these conversations enough now. It's probably, you probably think, wow, why didn't you guys get it sooner? But I think it is starting to sink in for people that we are looking at a, at a bigger challenge for Seattle and other cities in terms of data security, privacy, uh, data integrity uh, overall through many departments, not just public safety, but also through other departments in the city. And 
Um, there have been good conversations, and I think Council Members um, Harrell, O'Brien, others have started to think about this future of how does the city uh, put together some kind of panel? Is it a task force? Is it a standing commission? Is there a group that we task and that we populate with the smart people to come up with recommendations, uh, again, not just regarding a UASI grant, but this and the other things that have come up now repeatedly over the past few years as we get an advancement of some kind, the opportunity to do something, the challenges, and all of our concerns about privacy and what it means to live in our city and what are our expectations of both our privacy as a citizen going about our regular day and also the integrity of the data that we give over as a regular course of our day. Moment by moment, whatever we happen to be doing, we're giving data in some way. Uh, and that's, that's something that I think we all wish that the feds or the state would take on and come up with great rules about. Um, but again, this is probably an area where cities are going to lead and, uh, and have states and feds probably follow suit in the future. So I'll, that, that work needs to happen and I look forward to working with my colleagues on that this year. Any other comments? Council Member O'Brien. Um, I'm going to support this, re this, um, this bill, but with some serious reservations. Um, it goes a long way to hear that the ACLU believes they have worked out a system that will achieve their objectives, and Council Member Harrell and others, I appreciate your leadership on this. Um, just to highlight both what Council Members Clark and Sawant said, though, there's, we're collecting all sorts of information these days, and government has shown time and time again um, an inability to be transparent and clear with our citizens as to what we're collecting and how it's being used. Um, and it's a challenge, whether we're talking about facial recognition software or license plate recognition or smart meters. Um, technology is rapidly evolving. I think technology brings potential to do a lot of good things um, until we figure out how to have a conversation between government and our citizens about transparency and disclosure in a way um, that the broader public accepts. Um, we're going to find ourselves stymied about using technology in the way we want. And I think um, as much as I would like to see higher levels of government take this on, I expect, like many other things, this is something that they may have to lead at the city level. And um, I'm interested in working on that going forward. Thank you. And Councilmember Harrell, thank you. I think you've gone through a very prudent and practical review of this uh, in your committee. And thank you for the briefings that you've offered. Will the clerk please call the roll on the passage of the bill? Aye. Godin? Aye. Harrell? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Rasmussen? Aye. Suwant? No. Bagshaw? Aye. And President Burgess? Aye. Seven in favor, one opposed. The bill is adopted and the chair will sign it. <laughs> 